Today I'm going to run through some slides from a lecture I gave in February 2018 in Los Angeles, which has since been removed from the internet along with a great deal of other historical evidence that Graham Dunworth and I made the discovery of the neutrino CMB correspondence in early 2010. Now today, in late 2019, we have a much better understanding of how neutrinos work beyond the standard model and how anomalies in oscillation experiments might be approached using what is often called a sterile neutrino but should in fact be a very non-standard sterile neutrino, although in the end this underlying perspective on the electric vacuum makes the standard model look like the standard model should look. One class of neutrino experiments looks for so-called relic neutrinos, which uh, fit into the Big Bang cosmology, which we now believe to be incorrect for many different reasons. Uh, and this example is the Ptolemy experiment, which will search for neutrinos at a very specific energy, which is tightly constrained by the Big Bang model. Now, if neutrinos are not observed in this experiment, this is quite a good analogy to the michelson morley experiment from the end of the 19th century, which determined that the speed of light was a constant and is a basic principle of special relativity. Here, I've decided to name the Ptolemy experiment not after the famous Alexandrian mathematician, but after the last pharaoh of the Ptolemy dynasty, Cleopatra, just for fun. Now, the theoretical underpinnings of this approach are close to the theory of quantum computation, in other words, how quantum computers work. But this is not a practical kind of mathematics, it's very abstract and therefore very powerful and can be applied to many different domains of science. The ribbon diagrams for standard model particles here are, are a component of a category, where a category is an abstract mathematical concept that generalizes that of a set and therefore goes beyond much 20th century mathematics, although it's very elementary. From a traditional physical perspective, looking at the work of Diwali and others, we're using something like two copies of a topological field theory, in particular the Chern-Simons field theory that applies to knots and knot diagrams or ribbon diagrams. Here we're talking about a scale in the infrared for neutrinos and another characteristic scale in quantum field theory associated to quantum chromodynamics. On the neutrino side, the components of this field theory are about gravity. Now remember in the standard model, neutrinos do not have mass. And when they acquire mass, they're doing so in a way that is not accommodated by the Higgs mechanism. In fact, our neutrinos will underlie the Higgs mechanism because the pairing of our infrared scale with an ultraviolet scale is what generates the Higgs scale. The Higgs is secondary and once we have neutrino mass we can apply the new Higgs mechanism to all the other masses. Now like in quantum mechanics we naturally consider discrete sets of possible measurements in quantum gravity because after all there are three possible masses for an electron three possible masses for a neutrino, and so on. The handedness of the ribbon diagram, which is for the neutrino, is the same as the handedness that we need in the standard model. And data like momenta, which we would normally start with in quantum field theory, are entirely secondary because space-time is not a fundamental concept here. Running through the ribbon diagrams here, we see there are three strands for each particle and they each carry one third of an electron charge or positron charge so that the total charge can be one when all three strands carry a charge or if all three strands are neutral we're talking about a neutrino diagram now notice that we're missing two neutrino diagrams that's because the mirror copy if you mirror just the braids and not the twists which give the charges that mirror copy does not exist in the set of ribbons so just by drawing ribbons, we've explained why local states in the electroweak interactions as we know them only include half the possible set of neutrinos. Now, when we go to the full theory, we can accommodate all possible uh, diagrams, meaning that we do consider the existence of right-handed neutrinos. 
looking at the little blue diagrams on the right, we see how the vertical composition of those braids will actually deform into an unknotted set of three strands, and that is our representation for the photon. Algebraically, the simplest representation for a left-handed braid, a right-handed braid, and a neutral braid, that's neutrino, neutrino, photon, is this set of three matrices. These are three permutations out of the six possible permutations on three objects. There are some mistakes here in these braid diagrams where things aren't crossed the right way, but I'll let you figure that out. In general, three by three matrices are very important to us and we can introduce some very complex algebras which account for a great deal of physics using three by three matrices. Now we start with a set of 27 three by three matrices, where here you see now I'm considering entries with three possible numbers, but only in three places that look like permutations, where the numbers represent the charge. So these matrices directly represent the diagrams that we had before in such a way that there is a kind of Fourier transform between the bosons and the fermions. Take two fermions, get a boson. There is also a special set of two by two matrices, which come from the Fibonacci anion theory which is very important in the theory of quantum computers because it represents a universal way of doing computations. Now in this case we're looking at SU2 which is one of the fundamental groups in the electroweak theory. Never mind what I've written in the matrices, I'm sure there's a mistake there somewhere. The point is that these representations depend on the golden ratio and the golden ratio gives us an opportunity to work with a smaller set of numbers rather than starting with the reals and the complex numbers which are axiomatically difficult from our point of view we start with smaller uh, extensions of the rational numbers but which have a very interesting uh, number theory behind them as we go up in Fibonacci numbers the dimension of the gauge group as we would call it uh, depends on the Fibonacci number while we count up the strands on the braids. So we only get Fibonacci numbers, so we go SU2, SU3, SU5, SU8. An anion category has both braidings and a fusion rule. Now the fusion rule here is drawn as a tree, and this is very important because we see trees a lot in the usual scattering amplitude calculations in the standard model. Once we've understood these ribbons, we can turn the three charges on each diagram into coordinates for a cube. And these cubes are very closely related to the three by three algebras that we're studying, or rather, uh, Cole Fury's complex octonian ideal algebras. So the connection between all these things is very elementary, axiomatic, and now well understood. But our fundamental axioms are going to go beyond ribbon categories and look at general axioms for general categories in arbitrary dimension. Now here we're starting to draw a sociohedra, which we know are fundamental already in particle physics. We're drawing the sociohedron inside a simplex so that there are three pentagons inside this triangle tile, tetractus tile as it's traditionally called. There are four sociohedra inside the three-dimensional tetrahedron and so on as you go up in dimension. And now we want to argue that the combination of this well-understood combinatorics and algebra with a new perspective on the quantum vacuum based on the neutrinos is pretty much what we need to understand the standard model. Now our cosmological scale is telling us something about this basic vacuum polarization. And remember, we're going back to the Dirac equation, and the Dirac equation is the foundation of quantum field theory. If you like, you can think about something called the dirac mill universe, which has equal quantities of matter and antimatter, which is perfectly fine from our perspective because we don't have a classical space-time at all yet. And we're going to uh, put the neutrino axioms into this context without doing anything else at all to the standard model. So we want to explain neutrino oscillations and the standard model in the most efficient way possible. We're not even going to use GR because we don't need to. GR can be re-derived now using something called entanglement renormalization. And just roughly, I like to 
think of a combination of Mach's principle and Newton's bucket, where Mach's principle is cosmological and Newton's bucket is local, and both things are about spin. If I look at the universe spinning around me in the distance, I think of that as going either left or going right. And if I was on the outside of the universe, say in some antimatter domain or somewhere else, then it would look like the thing was spinning the other way, even though it was looking at the same thing. So this is telling us that when we think of something like spin, it's a cosmological concept, which we would expect in quantum gravity because we know that inertia is cosmological. Now, what do we mean that inertia is cosmological? Well, it's not that there's an absolute space-time, as Newton would have put it, although Newton was thinking probably more quantum mechanically than he's normally given credit for. Uh, inertia is something that can be reduced depending on uh, a principle which we call quantum inertia, where there's a wavelength associated with your Hubble scale. And if we have, say, low accelerations like we do on the outer edge of galaxies, where we think in the Big Bang approach that there's dark matter. Now we don't need dark matter because we have quantum inertia. So that inertial mass can be reduced to zero when that wavelength just fits within your observable universe, your Hubble scale. And when we talk accelerations, what we're talking about is UNRU radiation. Now, we haven't got any theory with UNRU radiation in it. We're talking about principles underlying quantum gravity where UNRU radiation would be a very good uh, semi-classical description of what we're talking about. Now, this is fundamental here because we're going to equate under our Fourier transform the neutrinos with the actual CMB photons that we observe. And when we measure the temperature of the cosmic microwave background radiation in the present day, we are now going to think of that as a fundamental measure of the time that we believe has elapsed since the beginning of the universe from our perspective to the present day. So this is no longer a random number. It's not random at all because it corresponds to a right-handed neutrino mass. This discovery was made in 2010 when Graham Dunworth was reading my blog. I was calculating right-handed neutrino masses within the 3 by 3 matrix phenomenology and he noticed the correspondence with CMB temperature. Now this correspondence is precise. We're talking 0.0117 EV and the only constant you need to turn neutrino mass into temperature is Wien's constant from the black body law. And as we know, the cosmic microwave background perfectly follows black body. And let's stress that the Big Bang model can never explain how the present day CMB temperature can possibly correspond to a fundamental rest mass in particle physics. And yet this is perfectly reasonable from a quantum mechanical perspective. We expect a localization of mass to have a lot to do with basic principles of inertia. We can explain the horizon problem, that is the uniformity of temperature across our sky within the CMB. We can explain that very simply by the fact that it has to match the neutrino mass. So where do our actual masses come from? Well, it's simple quantum information theory. We have three eigenvalues for a 3 by 3 matrix. Now we know how to obtain the ordinary neutrino masses by fitting them using some lepton parameters to the oscillation data. We have not yet measured masses directly, but the difference mass squared numbers are enough to give us precise values for the neutrino masses. And also precise values for right-handed masses, although we have to work on the interpretation of that. On the right, we have the basic correspondence using Wien's constant beta. And here, the law for quantum inertia, where inertial mass can be reduced to zero depending on wavelength. The only thing we did to switch left-handed masses to right-handed masses was flip a pi over 12 phase, which is mathematically the simplest arithmetic phase that we could invent. And with this bag of tricks, we now look at mixing matrices. Here we start with the Hopf algebra, which is the combination of all the permutations in the group 
on three objects. And a mixing matrix can be parameterized with only three parameters if the complex CP phase is derived from those three parameters, which it can be. In other words, we can obtain maximal CP violation for leptons using only three parameters. In fact, this was a prediction of this approach before the CP phase for leptons was nailed down. And here we are looking at various simple parameterizations for both the neutrino PMNS matrix and the quark CKM matrix. There will be some precise uh, complementarity between the leptons and the quarks because that is one of the fundamental symmetries that we see here. We should think of numbers like 24, 27, 216 as integer dimensions for important algebras such as the Jordan algebra for the octonions. Now, if I redshift my C and B photon to give a right-handed neutrino at precisely 1.3 eV, that is a very good match to sterile neutrinos within global fits to oscillation data from 2017. So 1.3 eV was a good match, then throughout 2018 didn't look like a good match, and now looks like a very good match since, uh, for example, the ANITA experiment, which indicates such to get that 1.3 eV, the only thing we're doing is redshifting that C and B mass by a factor of 1100 back to what we think of as the C and B creation time. This is like a quantum boundary to causality, if you like. Remember, we haven't actually observed the early universe and we don't need it to obey all the laws that we think it obeys within the Big Bang model. In fact, we're throwing that out entirely. Looking at the oscillation data, uh, the global fits really narrow down the possibility now for 1 eV steriles to be at 1.3 eV, and there are really no other remaining masses which fit uh, some kind of oscillation profile. And we don't really have to worry about well-known conflicting null results because they don't uh, apply to our neutrinos. Our neutrinos are actually standard model neutrinos, it's just that they don't behave in the way you would think massless neutrinos should in the standard model. When we are looking at these, uh, let's call them right-handed neutrinos, it's like we're looking at a state from the early universe. But now the idea of local universe, early universe, is not as clear-cut as we are used to thinking of it because locality itself requires at least those two scales. Now we can start to look at a range of other neutrino experiments, most notably solar neutrinos, which are now very well understood uh, using the standard solar model. Uh, although the Boroxino experiment only relatively recently measured the PP neutrinos, and they may have been in excess of those, which is nice because we now want to look at uh, the anomalies in our understanding of the sun just by adding new neutrino physics and nothing else. There are many future neutrino experiments which will clarify a large range of neutrino properties, in particular the mass hierarchy to start with. Now we expect a normal hierarchy where we have a sum of masses to 0 0.06 eV for the standard neutrinos. This was a prediction of this 3x3 three three matrix formalism from long ago, which now in 2019 appears to be correct. In summary, uh, with a little simple algebra and some very nice principles, which are well studied and well published, we appear to have a fairly consistent picture for a large amount of data we throw out the Big Bang cosmology, but we don't conflict with any observations. We can explain away discrepancies in the Hubble parameter, and these these were, again, predictions of this model before observations were complete. When we say no observable dark energy, I mean, we know that there's a correspondence between the dark energy scale and the neutrino scale. Um, this is a question of perspective. What, what I'm saying is that we're not going to use GR or any modification of GR to look at this problem. The R equals CT model is a component of this Dirac Milne universe which I referred to at the beginning. Our 3x3 complex matrices are naturally included in 
for example, the 3 by 3 octonion algebra, and that in turn is um, a component of M theory and other mathematical approaches, although we're throwing out most of string theory physics, which we were doing all along when we predicted that there were no supersymmetric partners to be found at the Large Hadron Collider. Another well-known anomaly is the positron excess, which doesn't make sense in the usual approach, but we would expect from uh, the dirac milne perspective. Future work includes uh, more careful analysis of cosmological problems, quantitative predictions for masses, mixings, and so on, the mathematical underpinnings of quantum gravity from this perspective, uh, a look at Dungworth's astrophysics. I haven't gone much into the astrophysics here, uh, but that, of course, is a rich area for research, and the connection to condensed matter physics, because the mathematics here is the mathematics of quantum information and condensed matter physics. So thank you for listening. This New Zealand tuatara, despite appearances, is not a lizard. Its evolutionary path is so distinct from anything you're familiar with from the rest of the world that it is not a lizard, it's a tuatara.